number 19 Georgetown gets set to host Pitt for the final time as Big East foes in the regular season a 14 game home win streak for Georgetown coming in but both of these teams searching for their first Big East win of the year. With former Providence head coach Tim Welsh, Adam Amins, let's dive into these two teams looking for that first elusive conference win. Loss against Marquette by Georgetown this Saturday. Tough losses for Pitt against Cincinnati in this past weekend against Rutgers. Both of these teams have got to get back on track. They didn't look like themselves their first three games. Well, Adam, usually in the first week of January, there's not a lot of urgency or desperation in your team or your or your season. But I think there's a, I sense a little bit for both these teams. They're not used to being in this position, especially Pittsburgh. Start off 0-2. They don't want to go on three. They've lost 50. 15 out of the last 20 Big East games. This is a different basketball team, I think, a lot better than last year. But still, confidence may be an issue for Pittsburgh. Well, let's dive into our one-on-one -on -one tonight to see what these teams can do to get back on track, get some confidence for a win tonight. Well, Pittsburgh earlier the season, they got back to their steel puff defense, and they got up on the glass. That's the way Jamie Dixon has brought this program and what he's instilled in this program. But the last two games, not so much getting beat on the backboard, beat off the bounce, not running good offense. And Georgetown, they don't run a lot of good offense. They're efficient at times. They don't have good guard play. But what is solid for them is their defense. A lot of 2 3, a lot of switching, and a lot of length. Let's dive into our starting lineups tonight. First for the visiting Pitt Panthers. We've got the same starting five as they've had every game except for one. That was Saturday. James Robinson, the DC native and DeMatha grad, is back in the starting lineup tonight for this Pitt team, along with Trey Woodall, the senior, in the backcourt. Steven Adams is the seven foot freshman from New Zealand that everybody in the Big East is talking about. Meanwhile, for Georgetown, four players at six foot eight or taller in that Princeton JT3 offense they like to run. Porter leads them in scoring and rebounding. Whittington is second in those categories on the team. And Nate Lubick, out of the five, spot just like Henry Sims did a year ago leads this team in assists that's part of the Princeton offense very versatile and just about everybody can do everything on the floor final time that these two teams will meet during the regular season as Big East foes Pitt is leaving for the ACC along with Syracuse next year JT3 and Jamie Dixon are tied up at six apiece in their head-to-head -head meetings in their current tenures at Pitt and Georgetown Three 17 year veterans is our officiating crew Carl Hess, Tony Green, Michael Stewart, all part of NCAA tournament officiating crews a season ago, over 3,400 games combined. And a good atmosphere here at DC tonight. Some Pitt fans have made the trip as well down to the nation's capital. game home win streak here at the Verizon Center. The last time Pitt was at the Verizon Center, that 71-70 loss to Butler in the third round of the 2011 NCAA tournament. That was a heartbreaker for the Panthers. That was a sting. It was, I was in the locker room after, and it's one of the most crushing defeats ever for Jamie Dixon. But this is a new ball club for him. Ten deep, start two freshmen. He's got to run good offense. Talibjan has really improved his efficiency as of late. Porter is a great shot blocker, does just about everything well, comes away with it. Georgetown coming off that 49-48 loss to Marquette. They can play at a slow slugfest tempo or they can speed it up. Inside of 10. Whittington, the hedge from Robinson in the switch. Hopkins over the seven footer, and Adams got a piece of it. Strong defensive possession from Pitt to start the night. That's what Jamie Dixon is looking for, trying to get back to their hard defensive prowess on that end of the floor. Well, the second half of the Cincinnati game was very troubling as he got blitz late in the beginning of the Rutgers game was even more troubling as they came out of the gates and allowed Rutgers transition baskets, wide open threes, and got out rebounded and really got outplayed from tap to buzzer. Trying to avoid back-to-back 0-3 -back starts in Big East play for the first time in 14 years. Remember, they started 0-7 a year ago, but they did not have a healthy Trey Woodall last year. They didn't have Steven Adams or James Robbins. This right. is a different basketball team, 10 deep. I don't think last year had anything to do with this year's club. I think this year's Pitt team is much more soft. There is Adams. The defense from Hopkins there, but an offensive rebound. Never hit rim. Shot clock down to six. Did it hit rim? I thought it did. 
And Tony Green's going to jog over to check it. John Thompson, the third. Ninth season as Georgetown head coach. Adam, I hope the shot clock operator had his cappuccino for this 9 p.m. tip tonight because these teams are going to use a lot of clock. Georgetown's had one game in the 30s already this year and two in the 40s. So right. both teams are going to be very, very patient on offense. We saw the shot clock reset to 32 to start it off here. Is the D.C. native, the DeMatha grad, James Robinson, has a lot of family and friends in attendance tonight. Patterson splits the double, looking for Zana out of bounds. Georgetown with two strong defensive trips to start the night. Give me some keys for the Pitt Panthers, though, to try to win this game. Yeah, they've got to re regain their swagger. We talked about it. They've lost this mind-boggling 15 out of their last 20 Big East games. And but you came in here to shoot around this morning, this afternoon, excuse me, and Pitt, really, full of confidence. Jim Dixon really likes this team. I think it, this team will grow as the season gets longer with Robinson and Adams really getting better as freshmen. Sana bodying up against Lubick. Got the first two of the game. Seven and six foot eight. He's the best assist man on this team, but everybody is very versatile for Georgetown's offense. You don't get the normal help you do it. Take three, four dribbles in the lane because Lubick is a good passer. When he gets in the lane, he sees the defense shrink. He looks for the three-point shooters. Zana to Robinson. Offensive rebound for Adams, could not finish at the rim, and it will stay at this end of the floor. It's just Lubick at the other end getting the first two. Lubick usually does his work from the high post, but here you see three dribbles, and then the old school learned that from his dad up right. in St. Mark's in Massachusetts. His, his dad is his coach, and uh, nice there move by Lubick. They're getting tighter on him, though, not allow that deep penetration in the paint. He didn't score against Marquette in 32 minutes. Three minutes in, two points on the board. Georgetown in the 2 3. They played this about 36 minutes against Marquette. Robinson the pitch to Woodall. Tag it. That's a good sign for Pittsburgh. The inside out, the extra pass, the ball reversal. Give us some keys for Georgetown, coach. Well, the keys is guard play. They need somebody to step up, make some shots, run the team out of quarters. Now a guard. He's got to be consistent. Hopkins couldn't finish. Robinson back the other way. Gets a little bit too fast. He's just not comfortable yet in this system. Adams rolling to the rim, and he gives Pitt the lead. There's a guy who's getting more comfortable. And beware, Big East coaches. This guy is a sponge for learning and development, and Jamie Dixon and his staff love him. His talent's there. He's just got to get a little bit more comfortable. He's thinking first, playing second. Right there, good reaction. A good feed from Patterson for the assist. Especially at the beginning of the game for Pittsburgh, led the Rutgers runouts. Today, they're a little bit more patient, deliberate, better movement, player, and ball. Georgetown 1 of 4 to start the night from the floor. They've never gone 0 and 2 to start a Big East season under John Thompson the third. A wild shot by Whittington. It will stay with Georgetown. Sluggish start for the Hoyas. Pittsburgh out to a 7 2 lead. When we come back, as we start the Big East campaign, Tim and I will take you across the Big East all season long and we'll get you to the Welsh watch. How do you get a for these two teams? How do they score some more points?
Adam, both these teams need to get in rhythm early and often. Starts with Pittsburgh. If they're taking quick shots, not making that extra pass, that isn't their game. They have to throw five, six passes, get good ball movement. Didn't happen against Rutgers. Rutgers got some runouts early. But Pittsburgh, when they have opportunity, they need to run. They have the athletes, especially the big man from New Zealand in the middle of the floor who can do that with the best. But Georgetown as well. If they start going into the lane and not making an extra pass, not running their offense through the high post and their cuts and getting their inside-outside movement, it's trouble. They've struggled to score in some nights where they've had tough opportunities inside. They don't have the great finishers. They don't have that great ball movement or guard play, but their defense has been rock solid all season. Two teams both in the top ten defensively in scoring D. But again, Pitt had a lot of issues with Cincinnati and with Rutgers in their first two Big East games. They didn't rebound the ball at all, as you, we, we've already alluded to. That was the biggest issue that Jamie Dixon talked about. Georgetown wants to rebound so they can run a little bit more. They haven't been able to do that at times this year. Well, Georgetown's problems are twofold a little bit in the half court. And one is that they don't have that guard. I mean, Otto Porter playing guard. They don't have a Hollis Thompson or a Jason Clark right. next to Markel Starks. And they don't have Henry Sims in the middle of the floor. And he was an excellent playmaker for them as a, at the five spot. Lubick's doing a very good job. They're all kind of getting used to their new roles for Georgetown. The whistle and a foul against Pitt here. Let me say this, they haven't had that many problems. They're 10 and 2. Right. With the first loss being uh, Indiana yeah, in yeah, overtime, yeah, and the other yeah, the second yeah, loss being a Marquette yeah, by one on Saturday. So their their defense, as we've said, has been superb in half court. Both they're switching man, but John Thompson the third's played a lot more zone this year because of their extreme length on the wings. Cam Wright, very good perimeter defender, checks in to guard Whittington. Came in for Robinson a moment ago. That was Henry Sims light right yeah. there. That nice little bounce pass speed off the high post running the high post offense. He's getting more comfortable playing that position, making that nice little smooth pass. Woodall, runner. Off the front rim. This is what Georgetown wanted. Rebound the ball and push the pace. Georgetown wants to do. They want to run their offense through the high post. This time Hopkins on the overplay. Zana overplays Lubick. Automatic read for Georgetown. You overplay it on the top side of your shoulder. Go back door. First foul was on Robinson. That one on Zana. No fouls against Georgetown to start. Carl Hess in a game that could be a little bit physical, a little bit I don't want to say necessarily Jimmy, but could be very physical tonight as a tight whistle. Look at that on Lamar Patterson. Georgetown likes the tight whistle because Pitt wants to be physical on defense. Georgetown plays more of a softer man-to-man. -man. They'll switch, as we said, and play a little bit more zone. Although this year, Pittsburgh has played more zone than Jamie Dixon ever has. Just rushing his shots there, taking his time, should have used the glass. Hit 10th in the country at 50% from the floor. They're coming off their worst game against Rutgers, 37%. They did not rebound well in that game either, as we mentioned. And then Hopkins for the first Georgetown foul of the night. It's seen to watch over the course of tonight's game how Pitt reacts to Rutgers. Georgetown switching defense. Cincinnati switched one through four. Rutgers switched one through four. Georgetown will switch one through four. And sometimes one through five. Their versatility allows them to do that. So far, Pitt has struggled a little bit in the half court identifying the switches. Different looking Pitt team. No more Ashton Gibbs. No more Nasir Robinson. But that top ten recruiting class with James Robinson and Stephen Adams. 
And a good start shooting from the outside. Two for two from downtown. Deron Johnson is a good shooter off the bench. The redshirt freshman from Baltimore knocks it down. They struggled in the first two games. Eight of 36 from outside pit in their first two Big East games. Well, they took too many in the Rutgers game. They ended up eight for 26. That's not pit like. They don't need to take that many threes. They only averaged 14 attempts per game. Trawick gets whistled for a walk. Don't forget ESPN's Journey to the Tourney, a season-long spotlight on games that will impact the tournament, and the journey continues this Saturday. Top ACC contenders, Duke, you saw a win earlier tonight, 15-0 now, to take on C.J. Leslie at NC State. It's noon on ESPN. Georgetown, good defense. The trap between Whittington and Starks, and they force a jump ball and take the possession away. Well, this is a new Georgetown look this season as well. A little one, two, two, soft pressure, but if you're loose with the basketball, they'll come up and they read it and they trap, and they've got that length at the top, and there Whittington, the six guy in frame, bothered Pittsburgh and turned it into a turnover. Second one for the Panthers. Georgetown just two of seven from the floor. Dante Taylor guarding, and he gets whistled for the foul. It's Hopkins drove on him. Taylor, a senior who was actually more of a starter last year, coming in off the bench this year. Pittsburgh has to adjust. Clearly, the officials are playing, playing the whistles very tight tonight. And, uh, they like to body up on cutters. They like to show hard on ball screens. And that drill drive, they got right into the chest. 14 fouls on Pitt. Porter posting up against J.J. Moore. Taylor the show on the double, and now an offensive foul on Otto Porter going the other way to pit. Only player in the country averaging 13 and 7 and two assists and two steals and a block, but he gets called for the offensive oh, that, foul. That's a very good call by Mike Stewart and a poor play by Porter. Not only even before the offensive foul, just that three, four dribbles against Pittsburgh. You're not going to be survived down in the low box doing that because Pittsburgh will just shrink and attack and eat you up with each dribble. Deron Johnson a little bit out of control and another pit turnover. That's three. What you need to do if you're out of Porter, if you take that second dribble, then you have to make yourself a passer you have to look weak side for opportunities for people spotting up because you have available shooters on the weak side that are open because of Pitt's help side in the paint six fouls six buckets six turnovers between these two physical Big East opponents each searching for that first conference win playing each other for the final time in a regular season Big East play illegal screen against Georgetown Nate Lubick call for his first. Well, this Georgetown team has been in rhythm all season long defensively, but offensively they still are struggling to pick up some of the system that they need to in their new positions. Good ball movement, and Taylor is able to finish at the rim. Wasn't the prettiest dunk, but it'll count. It looked like Woodall walked at half court. And John Thompson the third wanted. It was yeah. right in front of him. Georgetown's pressure is bothering Pittsburgh a little bit in the three-quarter and full court. Lubick, a very good passer. Taylor, the knockaway. And Taylor comes away with it. J.J. Moore with the tip. Right. Draws the foul and gets the bucket. He'll go to the line with a chance at a three-point play in Georgetown. Struggling offensively. Pittsburgh is up by double figures. The Pittsburgh's been rock solid on the defensive end of the floor, holding Georgetown to four. But offensively, they're making that extra pass and finishing with a flurry. Six different Panthers have scored the 14 points. Pitt up by 10.
Georgetown was riding a seven game win streak going into their Big East opener this weekend against Marquette. But despite the 18 points from Markel Starks and a career high seven assists, Greg Whittington at 13 and eight as well. But this was the end of the ball game. Georgetown down three. Whittington gets fouled by Trent Lockett, has three free throws. Makes the first two and Buzz Williams ices Whittington, who's not a great free throw shooter, takes a timeout, forces a miss. JT3 was not happy with that Trent Lockett pump fake on the free throw. Lockett misses both on purpose, and Marquette ends up with a one point victory. Georgetown 0 and 1 at Big East play, trying to avoid going 0 and 2 for the first time under John Thompson the third. Marquette has squeaked out two Big East wins so far this year. Marquette's going to do one thing at home. You, but they struggled with Georgetown zone and Georgetown hung in there all night long, but they never could get an offensive rhythm going and missed a lot of open looks. And right now in this game, Pittsburgh's physicality is really affecting Georgetown. Even, you know, Pittsburgh has five team fouls already, but they just can't get loose on their cuts to the basket, which they normally flow pretty freely. Pittsburgh's doing a good job of bodying up on their cutters and not allowing a good rhythm. Cameron Wright going to finish off a three-point play. Whittington who committed a foul. Sky's in for the board. Four points in the first eight and a half minutes. All for Nate Lubin. Here's Whittington finally finishing at the rim. A two for seven start for Whittington scores, the second leading scorer on this team. Well, that's where you have to attack when you get the ball down low against Pittsburgh. You have to go right away. If you delay, then the defense is going to attack you. Robinson was recruited by John Thompson III, again, the D.C. native, who won three city titles at the Verizon Center. He's very familiar with this floor. Taylor out there for the screen. He's the roll man, and he's still got it to go. That's the second time that Taylor has gone to the rim, and he hasn't finished cleanly, but finishes anyway. You hear, you see the high ball screen is really not even affect the screen, although Starks, excuse me, Trout does get screened, but on the switch, nobody comes over and rotates over, and they rotate over from the ball side instead of the weak side. Georgetown was in a switchy situation there, but Trout got so hung up at the top that Taylor was allowed just to run freely down the lane. This is where John Thompson III runs into a bit of an issue. He does not have a ton of depth. And a 6'8", Greg Whittington, who's basically one of the three swing men that can play a bunch of positions on the floor. He's got two fouls already. Not even halfway through the first. Smith Rivera, the true freshman out of Indianapolis, went to North Central High School, then to Oak Hill Academy, the powerhouse prep school. The whole team so physical early. Right guards Whittington. Foul is called against Pitt. That'll be their sixth. Pop that score on, and I can tell you the physicality of this game is being played, is being favored by Pittsburgh because they want, to, they're going to get up in your chest. They're going to get up and not only face guard you and trace the basketball on a perimeter, but off the ball. They're very physical and they're going to be on the free throw line the rest of the half now with Pitt at six. So they have to continue to attack. Greg Winnington, sophomore out of Columbia, Maryland, has been hot shooting the ball as of late. And this is where he struggles at the free throw line. And Coach, that was my mistake. Five fouls apiece in the first ten minutes, but a very physical start to this game. Right, looking for more on the roll. But that shot deterred by the length of Whittington, who's still out there with two fouls. Smith Rivera comes in and runs the point. He's got to get up the floor a little bit and try somehow to get a little bit of a transition opportunity. Porter got bumped, and he'll go to the free throw line. 
That's a, a foul. Good, that's a good move by Porter yeah, just because he, he got it even though it's on the first pass of the offense. Pittsburgh defense, Pittsburgh's defense was not set yet, and he saw an angle of the rim, and, and they have to try to create stuff out of the context of their offense because Pittsburgh's really bottling them off up, off the ball. Deron Johnson on the foul, first point for Porter tonight. Lamar Patterson back in as Johnson hits the bench. Otto Porter 13 and 6 against Marquette. Didn't miss one game with a mild concussion earlier this year. It was very early in the season. Back to a single digit ball game halfway through the first. Both teams looking for their first Big East win of the season. Meeting for the final time as Big East foes in regular season play. Patterson got it swatted away. Here comes Georgetown looking to push. Trowick gets bumped. Lamar Patterson called for his second foul. This is what Georgetown needs to do. They need to give a lot of help. And here, Porter and Ben Hopkins coming over. And when that happens, they need to attack up the floor before Pittsburgh gets set. Now it'll be one and one the rest of the way of this first half for Georgetown. Trey Ziegler, the transfer from Central Michigan, checks in. This is Trowick, one of the great sophomores for Georgetown. So, Pittsburgh personnel wise right now, but clearly point wise it does, but as the game wears on, your mentality will change if these fouls keep getting called and Pittsburgh will have to take a step back with their defense. Pitt probably has the depth advantage, 10 players with 10 minutes or more, not as much depth for Georgetown. Robinson finds Woodall. Moore unable to finish. Offensive rebound for Ziegler, and a foul is called on Georgetown. It looks like Pittsburgh was a little bottled up here. Ziegler not, shouldn't be picking up his dribble in that spot, but then Will makes a good play, flashing in the middle and in the weak side pass, but Ziegler stays with the play. Just takes the ball right out of Hopkins mix. Hopkins with two fouls now as well. Well, Trey Ziegler, seventh different Panther to score the 18 points. The junior from Detroit was at Central Michigan. His dad, Ernie, was the head coach. He was not brought back. And because of that, they asked for an NCAA waiver to allow Ziegler to play right away when he transferred to Pitt, a school where his father was an assistant under Ben Howlett. Pittsburgh doing some switching in the round, out on the perimeter on some handoffs. There's Trollick with a good feed from Hopkins. First bucket of the night for Trollick. He's got four points. Good feed again as we mentioned. A lot of these players can pass the basketball. Four different players with double-digit assists this year. Back down to seven. There's a little pressure. Georgetown's employing against Pittsburgh. Seems to just be rattling, rattling them a little bit, taking them out of their rhythm in the half court. Here is J.J. Moore for three. Hot shooting star from outside for the Panthers who had scuffled. And it's back up to ten. Well, it's the bench for Jamie Dixon. He's allowing his starters to get some minutes off here. Especially on the wing spot. Moore, a great athlete. Good spot up. Porter with a solid feed inside for Smith Rivera. And a foul is called underneath on Robinson. J.J. Moore is an important piece off the bench for Jamie Dixon. If he does that, that is a bonus because he's an athletic wing defender who can run the floor, but they need a spot-up shooter on the wing. They need more consistency to loosen up the inside. You mentioned it's struggling in Big East play in the first two games, three for three so far. Smith Rivera bangs in the first free throw. Two players apiece. Both sides have two personal fouls. A lot of substitutions in the early going tonight. Now, I mean, even in the last couple of possessions, I've noticed Pittsburgh's weak side defense has taken a step back. They're not bodying up on cutters as they did in the first 10 minutes of this game. The foul situation will take its toll over the course of a game and will loosen up the defense. 
Six against Georgetown, eight against Pitt. Back down to an eight point lead. Right against the pressure. Georgetown ball on the other side. The defense remains strong. Jamie Dixon not pleased. 7.56 to go, first half. It's been kind of sluggish offensively, but these two defenses have been physical and fun to watch in the early going. Just down the road from the Capitol building in our nation's capital, 22 14 pit out front. Super Tuesday from D.C. Georgetown trailing by eight, 7:56 for this first half. Second Big East game for the Hoyas. Pittsburgh's third Big East game. Some news and notes around the Big East. Five in the top 25. Pitt with a loss on Saturday. Two losses last week. Dropped out of the top 25. 15 teams, all of them over 500 in non-conference play. Marquette squeaked out a couple of wins. Something Buzz Williams told me a couple of weeks ago. He said, with all the hubbub of all the teams leaving and kind of the dismantling of the Big East, this is still the Big East, and it's still going to be a really fun year to watch. <laughs> There's no question about it. I think you're looking at about seven teams that probably will get in, but you never know with uh, who will emerge because there's, you know, there's always those middle league type teams that go either way. You know, a team like a Villanova, you know, they kind of started out ugly, had a loss to Columbia, uh, got beat up by Temple, lost to LaSalle, but Jay Wright's right of the ship down at Villanova, and they're quietly building something down there. They're kind of a different style, so those are the type teams to watch, and Notre Dame, very impressive last night over Cincinnati. Zana comes over for the block on Starks. Still 30 on the shot clock. Pitt off to a good shooting start tonight. Seven assists on eight Pitt field goals so far. Three assists on just four Georgetown field goals. The times they've executed on both sides, well, it's just been a little sluggish. Moses Ayegba is into the ball game for Georgetown. Starks driving in. It's last touched by Georgetown. It'll be Pitt basketball. Watch how Pitt attacks this pressure now. They have to keep a man behind the basketball. They can't pick up their dribble. You see Woodall manning press. You got to see Ziegler. That's a dangerous pass right up the court. Nine turnovers combined between these two teams already. Both looking for their first Big East win. Adam Amin, Tim Welsh on hand. Final time that these two teams will meet in Big East regular season play before Pitt takes off for the ACC. A good series these last few years. Woodall buries it. Back to a 10-point lead. Second bucket for Trey Woodall. Makes Jamie Dixon's outlook on life a lot better when he knows Trey Woodall is healthy. 0-2, 0-3, doesn't matter. He's healthy, and that's why they're going to have a solid year. He makes things happen all over the court. And there is Woodall with the defense on Starks, forcing another turnover. That's six against Georgetown. 
And Trey Willis still trying to get comfortable in both his new roles. His new role as an off guard with James Robinson and also his role kind of as the leader of this basketball team. You know, the senior leader, the guy who really has to talk to the team in the locker room and break this pressure right now. Yep. Get it over with Wright. This is Woodall's leadership here, slowing it down. Exactly. Understanding, run the sets, run the offense is what he does best. Zada has gotten a lot better in all phases of the offense as of late. Woodall with six in the shot. Against Starks. Has to hoist it. And Georgetown with a solid defensive possession. Forces a shot clock violation. Well, started with the three-quarter club pressure, and Pitt's still very uncomfortable attacking it. I'd like to see Pittsburgh go back to the guard behind the ball, but the other guard is on on straight line with the basketball. They don't have that cross-court pass, and they can't attack to go to score. Starks, he walked. Seven Georgetown turnovers. That big body of Adams came over to block off the path to the rim. Well, there's just nothing there. On, on one ball reversal, and you just put your head down and try to dribble into the middle of the lane against Pittsburgh. That is an absolute recipe for disaster. They, they need three or four ball reversals against Pittsburgh. It breaks the pressure. They give such great si weak side help that they're in tremendous position. They're never going to allow those drives from the wing right to the rim. Picked up by Porter, drive under to Travis, do a dozen to shoot. Tipped into the air by Whittington, run down by Porter. Here comes Georgetown. Smith Rivera into the body of Adams, and he deters. Steven Adams had big body inside, able to knock it free, a foul call on Georgetown. Smith Rivera just had nowhere to go. And both teams a little uneven at best. And here, Smith Rivera gets the ball on the wing. He's wide open, standing 17 feet from the basket. And the instead, he decides to dri drive into one of the biggest men in college basketball and try to go right through him. That's what you call a freshman mistake yep. against a freshman. Foul on Porter, his second. Seven feet tall. Made a name for himself during the high school campaign last year. And this is the front end. Was 35% of the free throw line in his freshman campaign. And Smith Rivera comes right out of the game because that's a teaching point to Lux. They'll make that to him numerous times. Take the jumper or slow down and reverse the basketball. Don't take it into the trees. Here's Porter crossing over and drawing a foul. They brought Iagba out on the perimeter that time to get Steven Adams' body out of the lane to set it up for Porter. And Steven Adams, that's that's also a mistake. He's got to stay down low. I mean, they want a ball pressure when Iagba does catch the ball up top, but if he, they do throw a quick pass to him, he cannot burn him. He's, Adams has got to stay in help right in the middle of the lane where he's a basket protector. We said one of the top recruits last year was playing at Notre Dame Prep in Massachusetts. I got a chance to see him at Hoop Hall this season ago, and everybody was talking about Stephen Adams, one of 18 siblings. Is that a, a lot of turmoil in his life coming from New Zealand? Jamie Dixon played professionally in New Zealand. That's all you heard about Stephen Adams. Got a chance to recruit him to Pitt. Well, when you look at his numbers, you're saying, well, he hasn't been that impressive, but when you watch tape, you see. Slow development, you see a tremendous amount of talent. I think he's just trying to pick up the system, do what Jamie Dixon wants on every possession. And he's a very, very good player. He's going to get a lot better between now and March. Deron Johnson. Porter had to go up against Adams. They're going to get a foul. Against the seven footer. Looked like Porter maybe used his off arm to try to get space on Adams. Thought at the best, that may have been a no call, but Adams gets whistled for his first. Well, with all these missed shots, nothing looks good. Everything looks kind of <laughs> awkward, you know, dysfunctional, disorganized, erratic, whatever you want to call it. And that time, Georgetown was in the 2 3 zone and kind of forced Pitt into a quick, tough shot from the perimeter. 
Georgetown continues to change defenses. Full court, three-quarter court, some switching man, and then the 2-3 with all that length at the top and on the wings. Quarter all four of his points at the foul stripe. Again, leads his team in scoring and rebounding and steals and blocks and third and assist for John Thompson the third. Georgetown has to continue to attack and play physical because looks like the only way they're going to score tonight is from the free throw line. And number 19, this has been the issue for Georgetown this year, is trying to get some consistency offensively. Have not had it tonight. Starks tipped that one away, but right to Johnson. Shot clock down to eight. Zana right in the middle of the lane. Got the friendly roll. That's what Pittsburgh does best against the 2-3. They'll X the post, they'll ball screen a lot of the top, and if you slide out too quickly, they'll bounce pass it right into the middle of the lane, and Zana can make that shot. Ten players play for Pitt. Nine of them have scored. James Robinson, the D.C. native, is the only one not to score this game so far. Pitt showing their first in the 2-3 zone. Lubick, the pitch to the corner and a Whittington three. A run down by Cam Wright. Pitt on the move. Zana ahead of the field. Throws it down and Pitt has its largest lead at 11. And a timeout from Georgetown. Jamie Dixon switching things up in deep foul trouble. Worried a little bit about Georgetown getting a free, free throw line, the 2 3 zone, and then the quarterback, the perfect pass. A little Ben Roethlisberger over the top. Which <laughs> <laughs> went off. College basketball continues Wednesday on ESPNU starting at 7. Another double header. Iowa State taking on number 6 Kansas. Boy, did Kansas get a test from Temple the other day. Then at 9, it'll be Arkansas and Texas A&M. First season in the SEC for A&M. Off to a 10-3 start, though. Games available live on Watch ESPN as well. Jeff Withy, one of the best shot blockers in the country, the best in the Big 12. And he had a he was big reason why Temple started to struggle offensively down the stretch on Sunday. Well, Temple likes to take the ball to the rim and they were doing it at will for a while and then Whippy decided to say no thank you and he had nine blocks so the Temple all the credit in the world though. Fran Dumpy's not afraid to play anybody. Just four field goals in this first half so far for Georgetown. Starks. That's a toe on the tape, too. Got it down. Markel Starks, just the fifth bucket for Georgetown in the opening 17 minutes. Oh, good recognition by Lubick. Took the two dribbles into the paint. Saw the defense shrink a little bit. Starks slid into the open gap and an open look. Starks coming off 18 in a career high, seven assists. Adams, great cleanup by Talib Zana, who's got six. He leads all scorers in this game. I think that went off the leg of Wright. Just waiting on a decision here. Carl Hess will stay. It stays at this end of the floor. But an 11-point pit lead tied their largest in this first half. Well, Georgetown's problems have been on the glass all season long. And when Pitt, when Pitt's playing well, this is what they do well. The follow-up by the big fella. Matt Chick on the other side.
Matt Chick here coming up at halftime. Other Big East action. UConn with an offensive explosion on their home court. Number one Duke rolls and number 15 Ohio State trying to cure its road woes. All of that at half. Adam and Tim. Matt, thank you. 11 point lead for the Pitt Panthers. Tied their largest in this opening half. Georgetown just five field goals in the opening 17 plus minutes. And Alex Ovechkin is back at his arena at the Verizon Center. The NHL will be returning likely to a 48 game schedule. Ovechkin's number is still pretty good the last couple of years, even though they've been down. Still in the top 10 of the NHL in scoring. Then, of course, as always, the Hall of Famer in his customary seat on the baseline next to the Georgetown bench, John Thompson Jr., father of John Thompson III, and the legendary Georgetown head coach. Always good to visit with John before a Georgetown game anytime you're in D.C. John Wall is in house tonight. Bradley Beal, who had a game winner against Oklahoma City last night. They're both in attendance. What are these guys doing here? They should be getting some rest. <laughs> Ovechkin looks a little tired from all those two days have a lot of time off. Georgetown more turnovers than field goals. Five buckets, seven giveaways, eight giveaways. Asked John Thompson the third before the game, what tempo do you feel comfortable at? He said, if it's a grinded out game, we'll feel at home. It hasn't been pretty. Well, it's grinded out on his end defensively, but they need to get some sort of flow going offensively. Not getting anything because Pittsburgh's just bottling up that time out of the 2-3 zone. Trying to make sure they cover Adams down low as well. He comes out for the screen for Woodall. Shot clock down to six. Right to Woodall. A three at the end of the shot clock goes down. Four of five from downtown Pitt. Seven for Woodall. Just lead at 14 for the Panthers. Hopkins nearly lost it. Starts in the corner of three. First Georgetown triple of the night. One of four from outside. The Georgetown's fortunate in that possession. They're doing a nice job of getting the ball in the middle of the floor, but when it goes in, the wings and the outside perimeter players are not moving into open areas. That time Starks. Kind of just slid down to the baseline, made a tough contested shot. Wright comes back with a runner. He's got four. Pittsburgh's getting really good guard play tonight, starting with Woodall. When things start clicking for him, everybody seems to feed off him. Yeah. That time, Cam Wright, a lot of confidence going with the left. And the steal from Wright. Woodall gets closed out, resets. Inside a minute to go for this first half. 14 of 25 from the floor pit. That's 56%. 10 assists on 14 field goals, and Woodall has led the charge with four. This is why Jamie Dixon is still in a great attitude in that shooter out there. He's got a coach on the floor with the ball in his hands right now. Trey Woodall. The shot clock at seven. Got doubled by Whittington and Hopkins. Got rid of it to Zona, who closes it out. And another John Thompson, the third timeout. Largest lead at 15. No panic from Pitt when he got Trey Woodall with the ball in his hands late in the shot clock. 100% healthy, and that's why Jamie Dixon is 100% confident when he's on the basketball court. He's made, he's made every type of play tonight, whether it's knocking down open shots, breaking the pressure, running the half court, or just finding something out of nothing. Thursday night showcase presented by T. Rowe Price out of ESPNU. Very interested to see Northwestern with no Drew Crawford, Penn State with no Tim Frazier. USC and Colorado will follow at 10 Eastern. Heard what Tad Boyle talked about when his team went up against Arizona. That Sabatino Chen buzzer beating three pointer. Had some interesting things to say to our Andy Katz last week. Check it out on ESPN.com. Thursday night showcase coming up on Thursday, ironically enough. 11 assists, 15 field goals. Woodall leading the way. This has been a really fun pit offense to watch. This is them at their best. He's in a rhythm. And just seems so confident. Cool, calm, collected. Running the half court. Great in transition. Always got, has his head up. 
anchoring the defense. Now Pitt back in the 2-3 zone. Six seconds left. Trawick got it blocked by Adams. And that'll close out this first half. And Steven Adams with the rejection. There's an injured Pitt Panther down on the ground near the bench. That's Trey Woodall. This is the block to close out the half against Trawick. Maybe see what happens to Woodall. Now when Adams, this is where many people just salivate, especially the people at the next level, because his athletic ability is the ability to go from A to B on the court with fluidity and quickness. That's Trey Woodall. You saw him maybe at the end got a shot. Collided with a Georgetown player right at the end of the first half as he delivered a pass. Wonder if maybe he just got hit. Maybe he got the wind knocked out of him. He's very slow to get up. He's being checked out right now. Hopefully everything will be okay with Trey Woodall. The officials are taking a look at the end of this first half. I'm curious as to maybe they decide to call a foul or not at the end of the first half. You can check the monitor to see if there was potentially a flagrant foul on the floor. Carl Hess, our lead official, is at the scorer's table taking a look. Here again, you see Adam just coming from the weak side. Tremendous timing and Woodall, the sense just to look up the court, throws a perfect pass and seems to get a shot. Let me also checking whether or not Starks fouled at the end of the play. Let's see if we can get a better look here. Again, Woodall is one on the right side of your screen. I don't know if maybe, it was maybe Trawick who got a hold of him or what. He is up, a great sign to see. The way he's grabbing his neck, I wonder if maybe he just got a shot to the windpipe or something like yeah, that. He, maybe. It looked like Trawick, Adam, got him with a forearm just as he was turning. But to me, it looked like a basketball play. Like he was going in, his momentum took him in. And when he saw Woodall had the ball, he turned, and Woodall's top of his body connected with his forearm. Carl Hess will come over to us, and he'll let us know exactly what he was looking at. And I think they are looking at Woodall here. Right side of your screen, number one, there's Trawick. And that's, again, what they're looking at. They can see it go back to the monitor to see if there's a flagrant foul. Remember the rule that was implemented a year ago, anything above the shoulders. Mike Stewart's coming over to talk to us about it now. Mike Stewart's actually using arm monitor as well to check it out. And Tony Green is coming over as well as Carl Hess is at the scores table with the official review. Mike and Tony are chatting with us and looking at the, the monitor and looking at what you see right now, that view, to see if there was an elbow or a forearm above the shoulders, and that's what is ruled as a flagrant foul since that rule was implemented last year. Trowick, that left elbow into the neck area of Trey Woodall. That's what the officials are looking at right now. Our truck is actually working with all three officials now and getting a chance to see our monitor. We actually have a wider monitor than the one that's at the scorer's table, so they've come over to check ours. Trying to rule whether or not there is a flagrant foul here. A 15-point lead at the half for Pitt. Tied their largest lead in the opening 20 minutes. But again, Woodall got a forearm to the upper body at the end of this half. And that's what the officials are taking a look at right now. That play right there. Carl Hess, Tony Green, Mike Stewart, veteran officiating crew, all with NCAA tournament experience. They're going to go discuss it. We'll get a ruling from them as well whether or not there is a flagrant foul on the play. Well, clearly, Trevor elbowed or hit a forearm up in the Woodall's neck area. Now, what they have to determine, Adam, if that was a basketball play, was that an, in an inadvertent play? Carl Hess just told us we think it's a basketball play, and if it is a natural basketball movement that just happened to be incidental contact, there will not be a flagrant foul. If he had apparently on purpose threw an elbow or anything like that when the ball is in his possession or something like that, that would be a flagrant foul. I think that's a good call. I think Trower's momentum carried him into Woodall. 
We're all got the loose, loose ball. Let's go to half. 15 point lead for Pitt. Nine turnovers, just six field goals for Georgetown in the opening 20 minutes. Kind of ugly for the Hoyas down 15. Let's go to the studio. Here's Matt Schick. Thank you, Adam. Matt Schick along with Adrian Branch here for your halftime report. Before this game began, my goodness, we didn't know what kind of game we would see. UConn taking on DePaul. Other Big East action. Enish Wolf with the dunk. Coming off that loss to Marquette. Getting it going here on the home floor. You like their baskets in the paint because this is their strength, the three-point shot. Ryan Boatwright getting his game right with the three and then throwing it down. <laughs> The little no, fella. No. Don't tell him he's a little fella there, Matt. 99 points for UConn tonight as they collect their first Big East win. Matt Schick, Adrian Branch. Huh? We, we were sitting here, oh, about an hour-ish ago, and you said first one to 55 wins. Yeah, yeah. Right now that favors Pittsburgh. Well, press me to 60 if you want. But there's a couple <laughs> things at play here. We talked about at the beginning of the show, the key to Georgetown was the rebound. And right now, they're down 13 to 6 with no offensive rebounds. So that means you're not getting a second chance opportunity. Now, this is the one and two best defense in the Big East. You're seeing right here, they're ready to defend. Nate Lubick is a good offensive uh, passer in the low post. There's a disruption to the flow of the offense. And then J.J. Moore has his eye on the pass to Lubick. Watch this right here. A deflection and a run out. What's the best way to score against a good defense? Score before they're set. That is textbook. Right now, they're more comfortable. They're shooting 57% from the floor. Georgetown, oh, my goodness. Give me that. How you do? Ugh. Uh, 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 uh. It's one of those uh, uh, right now. I'll teach you how to do that during the commercial break. Uh, Georgetown, Markel Starks right now. The leading scorer for the Hoyas with five points. Speaking of offensive futility, Clemson showed us that here in the first half against Duke earlier tonight on ESPNU. Duke trying to become 15 and 0, and Ryan Kelly. They're 38 1 when he scores 10 or more points. He had it going. He had it going early, coming off that 22 point showing against Wake. Look at the score: 10 to 6 with 11. Minutes to go. Matt, against the number one team in the nation, you can't shoot bad shots because they'll run out. And Ryan Kelly has been on fire. He went out. Remember, he left the game for the first injury. Hopefully, it's yeah. not serious because he's been dynamite. Yeah, didn't play in the second half there, but Ryan Kelly outscored him 12 <laughs> to 10. Yes. Who needs anybody else? But how about Quinn Cook? After a rough game against Wake, career high in points tonight. The courage, the perseverance, the short memory to come out scoreless, and he controlled the game offensively this time by scoring a career high. 27 points, all of them good shots. He's confident. This is now his basketball team. He is the point guard for Duke University. They need a confident Quinn Cook moving forward. Yeah, he was 0 of 11 from the floor against Wake Forest. No points. 14 assists in that game. That was a career high 14 assists here, career high 27 points. Number 10, Missouri taking on Alabama. Alabama feeling good about their football BCS. Oh, title. yeah. And carryover right here. They that came you, out and right? took the game to Missouri early on. They, they tried early. Phil Pressy to Alex Oriaki for the slam. Pressy and Oriaki both of them. Double doubles on the night. You can't forget Alex Oriaki won a national championship with you Connecticut. Come, yeah. Trevor Relliford. Hoop and harm the Kansas City native Alabama of 19 to 17. Now they're up one. Pressy to Jabari Brown, the Oregon transfer. He hit five threes. He had 22 points, and then they pull away. Lawrence Bowers. Too many weapons. Lawrence Bowers, their leading scorer, 16 points a game. Phil Pressy, arguably the best point guard in the nation. As Frank Hayden, he loves that guy. I think he would probably agree with that. Another nice night for Pressy. Alabama, a team that started 6 and 0. Oh, they've now dropped 6 of 8, but Missouri. Off and running 12 and 2. How about number 13, Creighton? Missouri Valley Conference action taking on Drake. The Bulldogs, eight game win streak for Creighton, not so much for Drake. Creighton, just so many weapons. This is a team that they won, they beat Alabama in the NCAA tournament a year ago. This is a team that could move 
deeper into the tournament. That, that play there was set up because there were four de defenders around Doug McDermott. He draws a crowd. You can't speed him up. He can score from the three-point shot, the mid-range. He's, he's, a, he's a lottery pick. 16 points tonight. Third leading scorer of the nation. Will Artino on the receiving end for the Jays. Taking the bite out of the dogs tonight. And Gregory Echenique over to Austin Chapman for three. It's going to be interesting to see how Creighton continues to play well and how far they can really go. I think they're an elite eight kind of a team. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And Creighton, boy, the margin between Creighton and maybe a oh, Wichita State in that conference and everybody good. else. Yeah, there's yeah those two are distinctive. 30-point win for the Jays. Number 15, Ohio State. 0 oh, and 2 in true road games on the year. They're at Purdue tonight, and Thad Bonnet was just looking for answers, looking for consistency. There's one for you. <laughs> Sam Thompson. When you talk about an attitude adjustment in this, Matt, I was impressed with how Ohio State came out. You know Deshaun Thomas is going to score his points, but the role players came out with a focus and a determination we hadn't seen. Like LaQuinton Ross with the basket and the harm. He missed the free throw right now, Ohio State. With a 10 point edge on Purdue. This is a Purdue team that beat Illinois. An Illinois team that handled Ohio State pretty well. Very young Purdue team. They're the third youngest in the Big uh, Ten right here. They're going to be opening some eyes. Right now, half the half. Pittsburgh having its way. Talib Zana, eight points at the half. And Pittsburgh up big. Stay tuned tonight. Program we think you're really going to enjoy with two hosts we really think you're going to like. <laughs> Patrick, Adrian Branch will be with you. College Basketball Live right after the game ends tonight at 11 o'clock Eastern Time. Baylor and Texas Tech. United Spirit Arena is the place. Two interim coaches. You've got Chris Walker, of course, at Texas Tech. And Jerome Tang on replace of Scott Drew serving two game suspension. If, when Baylor is good, they're very good because they can score with the dunk and then the three point shot and then the defense. Right now, Baylor is clicking again. That was Brady Heslip with the three. Yeah, if you're going to compete and maybe challenge Kansas, you got to take care of Texas Tech on the road. Isaiah Austin, the big man, can shoot. There's the video proof. Baylor running away. Puts up 82. News and notes for you. Duke number one in the AP poll. Fourth straight week. Lehigh star C.J. McCollum. Number two scorer nationally. Not going to see him for a couple of months. Yeah, a huge loss because the college fans don't get a chance to see this young man. Six foot four. Complete guard. He was dynamite.
And Louisville, Shane Bahannon out up to about 10 days with an ankle sprain. Right now, Trey Woodall feeling good, feeling healthy despite that elbow to the neck there at the end of the first half. Pittsburgh up 15 at the half. Jay Taylor, one of nine different pit players in the scoring column in the first half. Pittsburgh up 15. Adam and Tim have the second half call next. ESPN Super Tuesday here in D.C. and a 15 point lead for Pitt at the half in a road game against Georgetown. It ties the third largest lead ever 
at halftime for Pitt in Big East play on the road. This goes back to 1982. He's Tim Welsh, Adam Amin. Pitt was really impressive offensively. Georgetown scuffled only six field goals and nine turnovers, but 11 assists on 15 buckets for Pitt. Well, Jeff Van Gundy likes to say the NBA is a make-miss league. Well, college basketball is about who gets the best shots, yeah. wins. And Pitt clearly has got the best shots because they've worked their offense. They've made the extra pass. They've got inside-outside balance. They've not taken too many threes. They took 26 on Saturday, only five today. They've made four. They've picked their spots. They've ran the ball up the court. They've got the ball inside. They got in transition. This is why they're ahead on the offensive end, and then they've had lockdown defense against Georgetown. Nothing easy. Now, take a look. Look, this final play, right side of your screen, number one, Trey Woodall, and number 55, Jabril Trawick, they collide. Now, the officials got together for about five minutes at the end of the first half to see whether or not it was a flagrant foul. Here is what a major officiating concern for men's basketball this year is. This is from the rule book this year. Officials are reminded that there can be incidental contact with the elbow above or below the shoulders. Swinging of the elbow is required for the foul to be classified as a flagrant one or two. The, uh, the NCAA does not want officials automatically assuming a flagrant foul unless they're swinging of the elbows. There was some improper calling of flagrant fouls a year ago. You see Trey Woodall, he got the elbow to the throat, but he is fine. And starting on the floor here in this second half, the same 10 that started this game are on the floor to start the second 20. And a 15-point lead for Pitt at the half. And their Big East history goes back 30-plus years. This is their third large ever halftime lead in a road Big East game. Both teams looking for their first Big East victory of the season. Zana thought about it and hit it. Into double figures, the first player with 10 tonight. Lewis got to know, though. Zana can make that shot. He's made it all season long. He's got to get up in him and not allow that. Easy look, no resistance by Georgetown. Zana shooting 62% this year. He has really developed the mid-range game a lot, too. Hopkins was looking back door for Whittington. That was shut off. Porter to Starks. A runner in the lane left short. The long arms of Porter, the offensive rebound. Six for auto. Georgetown is getting nothing off their half-court offense. Pitt showing their own version of switching out on a ball screen there with Adams. But Porter trying to just make some things happen up. Something out of nothing. That's what they need. There's Woodall. Five assists in the first half for Trey. Robinson had three. He was the only one of the ten Pitt players not to score. Robinson got it rejected by Hopkins. A couple of former DeMatha teammates teaming up there. Well, Jamie Dixon not happy with that attempt, though. He wants that ball reversed from Robinson. And an offensive foul called on Mikhail Hopkins underneath the rim. That's his third. Still a 15-point advantage. Stat sheet from the opening 20. Zana led the way in scoring. Woodall led the way in assists. Georgetown, you talk about what they had. Nine turnovers and only three assists. Very un-Georgetown-like. Zana, the screen and roll, and a reach and foul called against Georgetown. I think this will be on Starks. And it will be. Georgetown just seems to be kind of a step slow on both ends of the floor. Pitt's got a little bit more of a pop in their step. Sometimes that happens. You start 0-2, you lose at home. You had to lead it for 32 minutes of a game against Cincinnati, and they've been here in D.C. for three days. They came down after their game on Saturday against Rutgers, and it's been Camp Dixon, and it's clearly paid off. The energy level has been very impressive in the first 22 minutes. Yet Pitt trying to avoid back-to-back 0-3 -back starts in Big East play. They went 0-7 a year ago. But Coach said it. This is a much different looking Pitt team with the young recruiting class, the injection of some energy, and that true senior leader in Woodall. Mike Stewart asked for a whistle. I think the clock didn't start right away. A couple of seconds will be taken off. 
Well, someone asked us earlier today uh, on the pregame show and the whip around it, if if Pitt lost this game, would that bring back memories of the 0-7 start from the year? And I, I just think this, that's apples and oranges. This is a completely different Pittsburgh team than a year. Foul the floor. Don't forget who Pitt played. Cincinnati's still a ranked team, and Rutgers has beaten four of the last six ranked opponents at the rack. That's still a tough place to play in the Big East. You can't take a road game off in this league. And they're still a developing team as well. You know, the pit you see tonight is not the pit you're going to get in a month. And I think that's what makes Jamie Dixon gets him really excited, especially the development of Adams down in the middle of the floor. Right. All we've heard since we've been here, Adams doesn't even realize how good he can be just yet. Whittington the help. Rotation for Georgetown. Good defense from Pitt. Porter posting up inside. Adams nearly got the rejection there coming over. Lubick runs down the offensive board. His length throw clearly bothers him in the middle. Porter kind of shied away from the rim. Trying to body up Iagba. Here he is. That one tipped away by Wright. Whittington. That's not a good shot. Cam Wright, an excellent perimeter defender with good defense out of Whittington there. He's so impressed with Adams' lateral quickness. Yeah. The ability just to come out and help on the ball screen and also just stay with a, a wing-type player and guard the wing player off the bounce. Some non-conference victories. They played a good Lehigh team with C.J. McCollum. Beat Oakland, which always plays tough. Obviously, the game against Michigan. Detroit went to the NCAA tournament a year ago. Adams left it short. Run down by Zana and an offensive rebound, fresh set. Right to Zana, 15 footer. This is the second missed shot of the night. A foul called against Georgetown and Whittington is going to have this one whistled against him. That's his third. Pitt very confident offensively looking inside to Adams, running their pick and slip on ball side with the two man game with Zana, knocking that wing shot, setting up their triangles on the weak side. Pitt in a better rhythm today. Agba and Zana battling down low. Agba from Nigeria, Zana, also a Nigeria native. Patterson closed out by Lubick. The pitch to one all a three. Patterson flying in for the rebound. Another offensive board for Pitt. One all to the rack. Got the finger roll. Largest lead at 18. Pitt right now beating Georgetown in every aspect of the game. Moving the ball quickly, attacking, loose balls, and getting into the lane and finishing with their later Woodall. Nine for Trey Woodall. Trowick getting bumped, and they'll get Zano for the foul. That'll take us to a timeout. Boy, Pitt has just been outstanding. 12 assists, 17 field goals, 53% for the floor. This is what makes Jamie Dixon smile. An extension of him on the floor. A little guy playing big.
see you tonight. Super Tuesday here at the Verizon Center and an 18 point lead for Pitt, their largest of the ball game. Georgetown's going to have to get something going offensively. Talib Zana has been excellent, as has just about everybody on this Pitt roster. Ten players have played, nine have scored, and meanwhile the Pitt defense, which struggled in its first two Big East games, has done all the right things that Jamie Dixon wanted to see. I think Pitt, Georgetown's offensive problems now are leading to some defensive problems, especially their aggressiveness on the glass. You don't score a little bit, you start losing a little hope and a little spirit on both ends of the floor. Moses Ayegba, the junior out of Nigeria, played his prep ball in Maryland. We'll go to the free throw line. It's kind of like the football team, Adam, that's with their defense on the field all the time. You've got to score a little bit. You've got to reward your defense. It's the same players, but they're making the bad plays on offense. Now they're making bad plays on the defensive end of the floor. They don't have their hands up in the zone, and Pitt outworking them on the glass to loose balls and dribble penetration in the lane. Third foul on Zada. Moses Ayegba has scored nine points all year. Didn't play last year because he tore his ACL before the season started. Did not play against Marquette at all. And not a lot of depth for this team. And Ayegba only averages about five minutes a game. He's played just about that, if not a little more, here tonight. Now their depth problem, though, is at the guard spot. They need better play from Trowick and Devontae Smith Rivera. They need some help out there with no Jason Clark and no Hollis Thompson this year. Oh, the trap was there, but they're going to get Trowick for his first foul. And John Thompson, the third, has to get his sophomore from Philly out of the way of Carl Hess. It's amazing. Both Carl Hess and John Thompson, the third, had the same angle. Let's see who had the better view. Looked to me like a reach in. Trawick again getting his hands in there. What all got rid of it? The times last year when Pitt wasn't playing well offensively, Gibbs wasn't performing well, Woodall was unhealthy. This was a team that could panic offensively. No panic here tonight at all. Well, they took quick shots on Saturday against Rutgers, got them in an early hole, but tonight right out of the gate, running their offense, making an extra pass. There's the length of Porter, and it still goes to Woodall, has to hoist one up. Lubick was able to tip it away from Adams. They collide. And a foul called on Nate Lubick. Well, Woodall with a sense of mind and presence. He had been blocked by Georgetown, and then Woodall with the presence of mind to get the ball up on the rim, and then kind of a takedown. Those were two points come March in the NCAA Wrestling Tournament. John Thompson the third being told by Carl Hess to go back to the coach's box. Or rather Mike Stewart I should say over there on the scorers table is telling JT3 to go back. They call it technical here. Technical foul call. I think that was the proper call by Tony Green. He was right there, and the replay clearly showed that Lubick, they got kind of tangled up, and he was the aggressor. Probably could have let them play on. It looked like they were going to untangle, but he did bring them to the floor. And that's a, really a frustration technical foul. John Thompson the third, is trying to find some spark for his team. And a couple calls have gone against him. And we only have 26 points in the first 35-plus minutes. That will make your blood boil. Back up to an 18 point lead, tied the largest of the game for Pitt. Knocked out by Porter. He was claiming Johnson touched it on the way out. 21 to shoot. We've seen slow starts. At the beginning of conference play, slow first halves in scoring. Cincinnati's been plagued by it in its first couple of Big East games, but usually they've been able to get it going to the second half. Georgetown's being tested here. Woodall, the pitch to Johnson. Tony Green whistles it. 
And it's going to go the other way to Georgetown. It's going to whistle a foul against Pitt. That's what happens after you get a technical foul. Get the old three seconds called. The old high school call. As I said, foul. That's say violation. Three seconds. Tony Green called it right away. You get one back. <laughs> Seems like you know from experience, coach. Starks can't finish. Iagba's tips with tip and go, but he's there. Moses Iagba's got four to spur. The crowd trying to get back into this ball game as Georgetown's within 16. Taylor left it short. Boy is on the push. Starts a three. Big one. That would have been huge. I hope this gave him some physical presence. Yeah. On both ends of the floor, kind of a spark and a toughness, but Georgian has to knock down some shots. Johnson answers with a three. His second of the game. That's what he does. A spot up shooter, the redshirt freshman from Baltimore. Go back on what I said. It is a make miss league. <laughs> Georgetown was open and missed, and Pitt was slightly covered and knocked it down. You said I have been giving them some physical presence, although Adams is off the floor right now. It's somebody to bang around in there with Pitt's physical inside players, and then Georgetown just laid, and Johnson makes him pay with a nice step in, step up three. Five of eight from three point range. The Pitt Panthers tonight, Johnson gives Pittsburgh the lead. Well, the important thing is the percentage, sure, but I think the most important thing for Pittsburgh is the second number eight. They're not taking a lot of th right. threes, they're picking their spots. The largest lead of the game now at 19. Cam Wright tipped it away. Iagba's on the floor, loose to Pitt. Lamar Patterson comes out with it. Here's Woodall. Approaching 12 to go here in D.C. The Panthers an opportunity to go up 20 plus. That last possession, that's just bad offense. That's not the Georgetown way. They beat you with the pass, not the dribble. 13 of the shot clock. It'll be Pitt basketball on the other side of this break. 19 point advantage, the largest of the game for the Panthers on the road. And you've talked about it, Coach. Steven Adams, the way he has altered shots and at least made things difficult on a Georgetown offense, shooting just 33%. We'll look at the numbers behind the Kiwi feed out from New Zealand. We talked about Steven Adams, seven foot, 250 pound freshman from New Zealand who played his prep ball at Notre Dame Prep in Massachusetts. 
preseason Big East Rookie of the Year. And some of the numbers you need to know on Stephen Adams. He's seven feet tall. 13 is his lucky number and his jersey number. He is one of 18 siblings in his family. And 19 is his shoe size. Those are the numbers you need to know on Stephen Adams from New Zealand. We mentioned that Jamie Dixon played his professional basketball in the CBA and then played in New Zealand and had some connections to get Stephen Adams. Well, the number I like associated with Stephen Adams is quick. Is that a number? <laughs> it, it is for now, yeah. <laughs> he's surprisingly he's got really, fast, yeah, yeah, he's got great quickness. I mean, you look at his immense size, but he's also got great recognition, a nice field defensively. Talking to a pro scout before the game, and we were discussing Stephen Adams. He said there seems to be a little bit of a delay in his game on offense, and I think that goes with just him trying to fit in and do what's right and what Jamie Dixon wants, but you see a lot of improvement from month to month to Stephen Adams. Shot clock violation. The shot clock only at 13 before this possession started. And Stephen Adams comes right to the scorer's table. He's going to come back in in a moment. There's Iegbo. He's given a good minutes off the bench, and he's got six quick points all in the second half. He's going to get a lot more minutes if he keeps playing like he is tonight because he's been physical, he's been active, energized, and that time, deft. Woodall. The runner wouldn't fall. Porter tipped it out of the hands of Taylor. Smith Rivera sizing up right. But not a lot of experience out there on the floor, but willingness not only to run the offense and be physical, but they're off the bounce with a nice touch off the glass. Moses Ayegbot of Nigeria also played his prep ball in Maryland. Smith Rivera at the foul strike. We said it, Ayegba doesn't play a whole lot of minutes, but. He's played 10 minutes tonight and is heading to the bench. Now Adams is back in the game, so we'll see how Georgetown matches up with the 7-foot, 250-pounder. For Georgetown to come with their full-court pressure and a little bit more aggressive. Montes Smith Rivera picks up Robinson. He's the only Panther not to score tonight. Playing in front of a lot of family and friends. The Amanda grab. Good pick and roll, and Adams couldn't get the finish at the rim. Cron wanted the offensive foul, and Smith Rivera was in there to try to take it, but back the other way to Georgetown. There was something that went on in there. I'm not sure if it was a block or a charge, but the big car crash, the, the Escalade versus the Volks <laughs> Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly halfway through the second. You got quick as a number and an outstanding car analogy from Tim Wells here in the second half. Smith Rivera, much needed three, was short. Right runs it down. First time one of seven from three point range tonight. And a foul on Whittington, and that's his fourth. How aggressive Georgetown is on the perimeter on these ball screens. Trying to go over the top. Adams coming up setting that running ball screen on the wing. And Whittington very aggressive trying to go over the top that time with the bump. And a 10-16 of the second half. It's bonus the rest of the way for the Panthers. And one of their better shooters at the free throw line for a team that shoots under 70 percent. Here's a new item in Jamie Dixon's scheme. Mix up the defenses, even with the lead going to the 2-3. Whittington, boy, did he need that one. Just his second field goal of the game. He's got six and a timeout call. What was once a 19-point advantage has been trimmed down to 13. A much-needed three-pointer for Whittington. Anything, you'll take anything if you're John Thompson the third. Threes have been minimal.
the doubleheader tonight on Super Tuesday. And college basketball continues tomorrow night on ESPN. You starting at 7. Jeff Withy, the former volleyball player, outstanding shot blocker, and number 6 Kansas. They're very good at home. 30 straight at home they've won. We'll take on Iowa State. Then at 9, Arkansas is 9 and 4. Texas A&M in its first season of the SEC, 10 and 3 overall. ESPN, the home court of college hoops with a doubleheader tomorrow night. Also available live on Watch ESPN, the AP Top 10. Duke with a win tonight. You saw against Clemson. Missouri with a win over Bama as well. They're 12 and 2. Minnesota getting ready to take on Illinois tomorrow night. They're number 12 or 13. Tony Smith has a very good basketball team in yeah. way back from last year. Saw them early in the season a year ago in Orlando before Mbakwe got hurt. And very disappointing that... He missed the whole season, but yeah. he's come back for the floor. Huge Big Ten game tomorrow. One off for Adams, who throws it down. It's the goal by number 13, Stephen Adams. Back up to a 15-point lead. Just the second field goal for Adams, but it is an impactful one. And that's how you attack pressure. You reverse the ball, get it to your best ball handler in the middle, and the big fella at the rim. Ayegba has given them good minutes here in the second half, but now he's got to deal with Adams. Porter fading away. Everything coming so difficult for Georgetown tonight. Adams to Robinson. Tipped in by Moore. Oh, nice little Adams, though. A little touch pass to Robinson. I think Robinson was shocked that the big fella just didn't go to the rack with it, but Pitt still finished. Oh, Iagba, not a good pass. He's trying to slip it into a tight window. Adams took it away, and Moore can't finish, but Patterson turns it into two. Jamie Dixon's team was awful rebounding the basketball in its first two games. They have been outstanding tonight. They've been outstanding since he came out of that timeout. And again, Adams tracing the basketball so good defensively at the top, guarding the middle of Georgetown's offense. Robinson comes away with it. Patterson to Moore. The foul on Otto Porter, his third. Well, this sequence has just been key by Pittsburgh's activity with their hands, tracing the basketball. Look at activity from the weak side. They're up on the ball in the passing lanes, on the bounce, and then just attacking from the weak side and making that extra pass. Please return to 19-point lead once again for Pitt, tying its largest of the game. Still 8-15 remaining. Georgetown needs to make a push now. This is the alley-oop earlier for Adams. This is how you attack the pressure, though. You look up the court, get it to your point guard, and then go opposite. And when you've got the big fellow there, you don't have to look very far. Just throw it up to the corner. He'll go get it. We mentioned Steven Adams, and we dove into the numbers and all that stuff, but he's had such a wild ride in his life. He's one of 18 siblings, as we mentioned, but his father passed away at age 13. And when that happened, Steven actually went to the streets in New Zealand and was, was living on the streets, basically, until his brother, a year later, his brother Warren rescued him off the streets, got him back home, eventually landed in Massachusetts about a year and a half ago, played prep ball at Notre Dame Academy, Notre Dame Prep, because of the New Zealand connection for Jamie Dixon, who played professionally in New Zealand, had some scouts that were looking around New Zealand. He found Stephen Adams, brought him to the stage, and he has been phenomenal as a freshman. And Pittsburgh has its largest lead at 21. Inside of eight to go. Starts rounded out, just nothing going down. I echo the offensive rebound. Two of nine from outside Georgetown. Starks, Adams comes over for the rejection. There was a foul called on Pitt before the block, though. It'll be a foul on Trey Woodall. But Steven Adams doing it at the defensive end and at the offensive end. When you have a presence like this, you just sit back and say, attack and throw it up there because I'll return to center on the other end as well.
ESPN College Basketball available live anytime, anywhere on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at watchespn.com and with the Watch ESPN app. App Store, Google Play, Xbox 360, Watch ESPN. Season low scoring for Georgetown this year is 37. That was in a win, surprisingly enough, that slugfest against Tennessee. Pittsburgh, their defense, the lowest total they've allowed was to a MEAC team at Bethune Cookman at 40. They've only allowed 34 tonight. Now, how about the improvement from the last two Big East games as well? Well, I think Pitt's improvement tonight started with their offense. They moved the ball better. They had harder cuts. Uh, they made the extra pass, better timing. Their defense has been there all season long. But tonight, they played together on both ends of the floor. They're talking, they're active with their hands. So impressed. The Pittsburgh teams, Jamie's best teams, have always been so active. They, he really works on that high hands, tracing the basketball, you know, up in the passing lanes, but helping each other. I think, really, they're up in Georgetown's face and grill. And Georgetown just, even their open shots now are a little bit rushed because of Pittsburgh's ability to close out. Did you notice as a coach that when your team got a couple of buckets, played better offensively, that it just naturally allowed them to be more energetic defensively? Absolutely, but I also noticed when we didn't score that your defense took a step back. And I think that's what's happening now in Georgetown. They've taken a couple punches in the gut. They answered, but when the ball doesn't go in the basket, it becomes really frustrating. It's hard to go back down to that other end of the floor and, and just play lockdown defense and get up on the glass. But they have to continue to do it and try to make something happen with their pressure and get some easy buckets. Starts to the bench, two for eight from the floor tonight. Six points. Smith Rivera back in. There's Robinson, and now every Pitt Panther has scored in the D.C. native in the Math of Grad, about seven miles away. James Robinson won three city titles at the Verizon Center scores. Yeah, they're flying right now. Georgetown's in a stroll, and Pitt is just running right by them on every, in every aspect of the game. There's Trowick. Adams didn't block it, but he altered it. Robinson ahead of the field. Absorbs and will go to the free throw line as Porter gets called for his fourth. James Robinson, a top five guard coming out of high school last year from DeMatha, the winningest player in DeMatha history. And that is saying a lot because our guy Adrian Branch went there. There have been a number of not only college players, but NBA players that have went to DeMatha High School. And Robinson has won more than any of those guys in 120 games, including the three city titles. And he's got the best assist to turnover ratio amongst everybody in the Big East and amongst every freshman in the NCAA. Well, he's rock solid on both ends of the floor. He's still learning the game, but it's it's nice when you can come in as a freshman. He's got great credentials, great pedigree, and coaching. You play for Jamie Dixon, and you've got Trey Woodall standing next to you in the court. <laughs> That's pretty good. Good, good tutor, I guess, too. And Jamie Dixon, that's a big coup. He lured Robinson away from the D.C. area, got him to pit. Jamie's got some D.C. ties, too. At least he could have. You know he got drafted by the Bullets. 1987 was the 150th overall pick. And there is Lubick on the pick and roll for his third bucket of the night. That's when the NBA draft went a little deeper. 170-some-odd players got drafted every year. Those were the days. <laughs> And Jamie got drafted in that draft. Howard Trish, Brandon Trish's uncle, the Syracuse star. Shot clock down to eight for Woodall. Adam Smidrange banted in. And when it's going your way, it seemingly is going. Oh, you knew that was going in. There's no question about it. I, I called that from here. That's going in. Jamie Dixon. Did all the right things in the last three days between the Rutgers game and tonight. Smith Rivera smooth little jump shot, his first field goal. Going for moments tonight. I remember doing a game here last year against Marquette, Georgetown. They were down by 17 with about 13 to go. And they were able to come back and eventually win that game. You had a sense that maybe there was an opportunity if they could make a couple of shots, but Pitt's defense is too good to them. 
Pitt's defense is too good, and right now Georgetown frustrated on the offensive end. They're trying to go to the offensive glass. They're not rotating back, and when they miss, Pittsburgh's just attacking and getting easy buckets in transition. It's never felt out of sync offensively tonight. This is when you know it's, it's your night if you're pit. Tim grabbed my arm and said, yep, watch. <laughs> Steven Adams do it too. That's what you call a special player, right? He goes on a four-hour bus ride back to Pittsburgh today. He may stroll up to the front seat on the left and say, excuse me, coach, I told you I could shoot jumpers. Jamie's going to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go back down where you belong. There are pro scouts and us to see Stephen Adams. One last note on Jamie Dixon being drafted. He was picked seven spots ahead of our former colleague and current NC State head coach, Mark Godfrey. And also in that draft, Billy Donovan, 68th overall. That and a dollar gets you a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, Jamie never played in the NBA. Played in the CBA and then in New Zealand. I was a very good player at TCU. Yeah, and a great, yeah, great career at TCU. And a down year last year for Jamie Dixon in his what was his ninth season at Pitt after making eight straight NCAA tournaments. Pitt had made 10 consecutive NCAAs before missing out last year. A foul away from the ball here. Well, Adam Georgetown somehow, some way, has got to find the way. Cure their ill wills. Offensively, and it's got to come from the guard spot. So, somehow they've got to find an easier way to score. Or they'll continue to build with this pressure, maybe trap a little bit in their zone. But you can only go to the well so often, but I think you can win games in the 40s. I know John Thompson III doesn't want to play that way, but they have been forced to as of late because of, of their inconsistent guard play. It's a foul on Aaron Bowen, redshirt sophomore out of Jacksonville, who's on the floor right now for Georgetown, playing in his eighth game this year. Georgetown's going to have to figure it out because they got to go to the big city. Bright lights of Manhattan on Saturday to take on St. John's, who had that very impressive win you saw on Saturday against Cincinnati. Robinson smooth. He's got five points tonight. Lubick takes a spill. He just slipped. We'll get Taylor on some contact on the foul there. Lubick went down hard. To see him back up. It's interesting. This is the same Georgetown team that took Indiana to overtime. Yeah. They beat UCLA. They beat Texas. They played a very difficult non-conference schedule. And they're just out of sync, out of rhythm. And John Thompson the third. He'll he'll find a way to get the, them back on track. Just lacking offensive confidence right now. And don't forget, in those games they played well offensively. Seventy points in. in a handful of those games, they took IU to overtime, up in the 70s against UCLA. This is the play a moment ago as Lubick has seven points tonight. Lubick has been one of the bright spots for Georgetown. He's kind of thrown his body around all night long. He's run the floor. Effective in the middle of, of the paint at times. Nice save by Smith Rivera. Inside of four to go. Devontae's short on the three. Final 3.48 to go, 24-point lead. Well, we're at the Verizon Center. That's on F Street, a little bit down the way, 1600 Pennsylvania is where the president resides. The White House here in D.C., 24-point lead. Pit.
Coming up after the game on College Basketball Live, Duke remains perfect with a career night from Quinn Cook. We'll hear from Coach Krzyzewski after the win. UConn as well with a nice win in the Big East. And we'll have your plays of the night. We will see you after the game. Back to Adam and Tim. Matty, we'll see you in 348 of game time. 24-point lead for Pitt. Largest of the game tonight. Defensively, Pitt did not play well against Cincinnati. Did not play well against Rutgers. And they had a couple days to think about it and work with Jamie Dixon. They got, he, he got it back on track tonight. Well, offensively, they've been together and active all night long, making the extra pass. But defensively, as well, defensive chemistry in court, helping each other, active hands, toughness, gritty, steel curtain defense. But Jamie D Dixon has preached for years. That's why he's one of the winningest coaches in college basketball. Tonight, they've delivered. Shot clock winding down. Zana has had a fantastic night. Largest lead of 26 for Pitt. Well, they're sharing the basketball. They're finding those gaps, that weakness in Georgetown's defense. That time, a little ball reversal. Zana's can knock down that shot all night long. Wigton left it short. Pitt did not make the NCAA last year. They did make the CBI. They got an invite to the CBI and won the college basketball invitation last year. Ziegler gets his first field goal of the night. He's got four. Jamie believes in this team, and he believes in his 10 men. He hasn't wavered at all. He's right. had the two early losses. He's continued to play everybody their minutes, and tonight everybody's accepted their role and stepped up. Georgetown, a team, one of four teams in the country that does not have a senior on its roster. And I think that might jar some people because people think of Otto Porter and not a senior necessarily, but they think of Porter and Whittington guys that have been around because they were so experienced as freshmen that you'd think that they've been around a little bit longer. They've got a great sophomore class in Lubick, a junior, but no seniors on this team. Who do they look to for leadership? Well, it's got to start with Otto Porter Jr. and Markel Starks, but they also want Hopkins to feel better about his role out there on the floor. I mean, Georgetown's about all the pieces coming together. It's never been about one guy. And right now, really, the lack of guard play is very evident. They don't have anybody that can go get a shot, go make a play at the end of the clock. And right now, that's killing them because people are just taking away the inside, really ganging up on Porter on the outside as well. Aaron Bowen got into the air there, threw it away. You see again, one of four teams in the country without a senior Penn, Navy, and Wright State of the other three. Well, they lost three very, very good players. Good. The guys that won a lot of games for John Thompson III and Jason Clark, Hollis Thompson, and Henry Sims. And you want your younger players to step up, and sometimes it's a process. And listen, they have stepped up this year, and we already talked about it. I mean, they have won games against quality opponents. So this may just be a... A bump in the road for them. Credit Pitt, too. They played a very good game, one of their better defensive games this year. Well, absolutely. You always want to blame somebody. You know, say, well, Georgetown played off a lot of times. There's a reason for it. And Pitt's a big reason why tonight. Pitt is a huge reason. Playing against their tough man to man defense. And also, their zone was pretty decent at times tonight as well. And I, I like that about Pittsburgh this year, that they're not afraid to keep you off balance a little bit, just to change defenses in the middle of the game. And in the past, Jamie Dixon would only go to zone out of kind of a desperation if they were losing the yeah. game and they couldn't guard you, man. Now he's switching up in the middle of the game, even with the lead. Pittsburgh in every aspect of the game they've excelled transition they've attacked the press properly they've run good half-court offense they've got the ball inside they've got to the free throw line 
transition has been good when it's when it's been there. It has the athletes to run, and I like that they're looking to run when they have that opportunity. But tonight, when they didn't have that opportunity, they didn't rush their half court offense. A pit crowd that has made the trip, and we're talking with. Greg Hotchkiss, who's the SID for Pittsburgh, he said there's a lot of pit fans in the D.C. area. They're making a lot of noise, actually. They've got a little section behind us. That four-hour bus ride, trust me, <laughs> a lot more enjoyable tonight. That's right. Loosen your tie and just want to think about all the good things you did for once. This will be likely the largest pit victory ever at Georgetown. This is the 77th meeting all time between the two teams. Right now, 27 point game, the largest win ever in D.C. for Pitt, 18 points back in 1997. Most likely their last visit here. Yes. Something strange happens and these two teams get together for a non conference game. They're not scheduled to. Obviously, could face each other in the Big East tournament, but this is, for the time being, the last scheduled regular season meeting between Pitt and Georgetown. Pitt will take on a Marquette team that has squeaked by, but has played very tough in its first couple of games. You'll see him on Saturday. Beth Mowen's Tim Welsh on the call for ESPNU. You and I will see him at Villanova next Wednesday. That game, by the way, is not at Wells Fargo. That game is at the Pavilion on campus at Villanova, which is a very tough place to play. You said Jay Wright's team is a very interesting team. If you've watched one game, you haven't seen the right, you haven't seen the Villanova team because you have to see them a couple of games to really get a sense of who they are. Well, they have a new identity now. They just kind of play a hard hat, physical type game. They want and ugly on offense at times. They try to get to the free throw line. Get to the free throw line about 28 times per game. And an outstanding freshman at the point. Ryan Archibiakini. Yeah. Can't wait for you to say that next week. <laughs> it's one of my favorite names in the Big East in the early part of the season. <laughs> Tim and I will be with you just about every Wednesday, bringing you the Big East this season on ESPNU, part of our Wednesday night hoops package. Looking forward to it. I know there's been a lot of disdain because of what's happening with the Big East around the country. Still, it's not completely solved and not completely ironed out, not completely clear what's going to happen, especially with the seven Catholic schools, the basketball-only schools, deciding to form their own conference. But this year, and Buzz Williams talked to us about it a couple of weeks ago. He said it, and every coach, I imagine, is going to feel the same way. This is still the Big East as we know it for at least one more year, and that still makes it a very difficult and one of the toughest conferences in the country to play in and against. I'm not big on New Year's resolutions, but I have one this year, and that's not to talk about realignment. Yeah, I think I'm. That's just a gonna, good point. You know, I'm I with wanna, you. I'm I want to enjoy you. these games for the next two months and what we've always known as the Big East. And uh, you know, when the schedule comes out next year. Just give it to us, and we'll enjoy those games. Yeah. Whatever, wherever we go, and there'll be basketball games played. But for the time being, this is a great conference still. Jersey native John Caprio into the ball game. Watch out. Final half minute. Pitt will move to 13 and three, one and two in the Big East play. Georgetown will fall to 10 and three, 0 oh and two in the Big East. Pitt will face, say, or rather, Pitt will face Marquette this Saturday, as we mentioned. St. John's is next on the docket for the Hoyas. Then next week at home against Providence. That schedule doesn't get any easier. We mentioned it: five teams in the top 25. Pitt just dropped out of the top 25. They're still receiving a vote in the AP poll. Can't take a road game off as these coaches and players and fans are well aware. It's still one of the toughest conferences in the country to play in. Well, we talked about Pitt and regaining their swagger. And what does that mean? That means becoming a, a feared opponent again. Going in tonight, I was shocked to see that they had lost 15 of their last 20 Big East Conference games. But again, what happened last year has nothing to do with this team because this is a different Pitt basketball team. And tonight they show it. 
The Georgetown Hoyas with their largest victory ever on the road at Georgetown. They win tonight by 28 points, 73 to 45. They get their first Big East win of the season. Georgetown has dropped back-to-back -back games. For Tim Walsh and our great crew, Adam Amin sings so long from D.C. We go to Matt Schick in our studio along with Adrian Branch.